It's my pleasure to now welcome to the Scarlet Faithful podcast, new Rutgers women's basketball coach, Coquise Washington, two months on the job. I can only imagine uh, how hectic it's been uh, for you. And thank you so much for taking time to be here. Oh, it's my, my absolute pleasure. Well, congratulations uh, on uh, being at Rutgers and uh, did want to touch on that just in terms of what your priorities have been, um, how you've handled the whole uh, transition um, and what it's been like your first two months at Rutgers. Well, it's been busy <laughs> for sure. It's been busy. Um, we had to hire an entire new staff. Um, so that was for, for a while there, I was literally the only person employed with Rutgers women's basketball. <laughs> Um, so I was juggling a ton of balls, um, but the, the priority uh, in the first two months has been building our staff uh, because certainly this job is one that you need quality people around you to make, the, make, make Rutgers women's basketball uh, what we want it to be um, and what it has been in the past. And uh, so uh, that was priority number one was, um, you know, hiring a staff. Um, getting to know the, the the Rutgers community. You know, I'm not familiar with everybody in the community. That's the athletic community, the university community, and certainly the local Piscataway, New Brunswick. And I've learned there's a New Brunswick, there's a South Brunswick, there's a East Brunswick, there's, you know, all these Brunswicks. So, <laughs> you know, uh, the area, but, you know, those probably are the two biggest things were, you know, getting our staff together and then getting con connected and familiar with our community. And then touching on that, building your staff, um, you know, hiring Tasha Pointer, former mm -hmm. Rutgers star, uh, longtime assistant for Coach Stringer, um, obviously had a head coaching experience as well. Yeah. Um, what was your relationship with her prior to Rutgers? How did you identify her um, as a target? And um, what does she bring to your program? Well, you know, I, I first got to know Tasha as a player. Um, when I was an assistant coach at Notre Dame, I absolutely could not stand Tasha Pointer. I mean, she was just a little... She was so good, um, but Tasha was a trash talker out there, man. She would try to get in your head, as get in our players' heads, and you know we'd be like, "Listen, you can't listen to Tasha Pointer. Don't let her get you off your game." Um, <laughs> such a such a good player. Um, so I had a ton of respect for her and and what she could what she accomplished as a player in the in the Big East. And at that time, you know, the Big East was was you know a, a crazy competitive conference. Um, and then uh, when she transitioned into coaching, I got to know her as an assistant coach and just, you know, crossing paths on the recruiting trail and being in the gyms with her sometime. And, um, you know, I got to know her off the court and, and she's just such a bright young woman um, and, and just her passion for basketball um, and coaching and connecting. Uh, I, I just got to see that just as colleagues. Um, so when I got the got this job, the first person I thought of in terms of, of an assistant coach was Tasha Pointer, because I know that she knew I knew that she knows the community. Um, she's had so much success here. And over the years, I've always felt the love that she has for this program and her university. So it was kind of a no brainer to uh, add her to the fold. And she's been phenomenal um, just in the in the short time that that she's been here in terms of helping me understand the community and the, and the connections that she has and the connections with the, the women's basketball alums. It's, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal pairing having her here. And uh, second assistant you, you hired also has head coaching experience, Nikki McCray Penson. Yes. Um, what was your relationship with her and um, how important is it to you to have two experienced assistants like that, that have been in your shoes before and can relate to, to your, your current role? Yeah. So Nikki and I go way back. We were teammates together okay. um, in the WNBA. We played a couple of years together with the Indiana Fever. Um, okay. So I got to I got to know Nikki back then. And um, the thing that I love about Nikki is Nikki is driven. I mean, she is passionate and she is driven to succeed in everything she's, she does. When she was a player, I mean, it was pedal to the metal. I got to, I, I want to be as good as I can possibly be. And so that work ethic um, has shown up across the board in, in her background. 
Uh, she was an All-American player at Tennessee. She won national championship as a player at Tennessee. She's a two-time gold medalist Olympian. She was a WNBA All-Star. And then when she got into coaching, she goes to South Carolina with Dawn Staley, and they win a national championship. So I just want a little bit of that success to, to sprinkle off on, on our program and our, our players, and they can they can have sharing a little bit of that success. But she's just a worker. Um and she is uh, a person that builds relationships very well and, and they're strong and they're deep. And um, so having both of them with head coaching experience was um, really, really important because I felt like they could come in and hit the ground running in terms of knowing what they need to do in, in their respective roles. It's pretty remarkable, too, with the three of you. I mean, you you played for three legends in the sport between uh, Coach C. Vivian Stringer, Muffet McGraw, and Pat Summit. Um, I guess, how does that experience, aside from, you know, obviously all had uh, accomplished playing careers um, for them and, and professionally, um, but how much is that kind of drawn into it? And and do you even use that in recruiting? Do you use that in, in uh coaching your team and, and drawing lessons that you've all learned from those coaches? Absolutely. You know, we um, we talk about it when we're in our staff meetings, like, you know, what would c -Bib do? What would Pat do? What would Muff do? You know, and how and, and their influence, influence on all three of us. You know, it's readily felt that, you know, they've impacted us. And and you're absolutely right. You know, having um, three people on our staff who have firsthand knowledge of what it what it takes to build a championship program you know what it looks like what it sounds like you know what the energy should be like what the process is um you know that's that's critical and to have it from you know like like you said three different three different styles you know coach stringer and pat summit and muffet mcgraw you know they're they all did it three different ways mm -hmm. you know so to have those different styles at kind of at our disposal um, it's pretty cool. And we have some great conversations in in, in our in our uh, conference room. And I uh, don't want to leave John Hampton out as your third assistant uh, yeah. hired. Uh, what, what was his um, did you have any background with him prior to and uh, what does he bring to his role? Well, um, I did not have a background with him, um, but, you know, one of the things that that I wanted to cover um, in building our staff was somebody who has some pretty deep East Coast ties. Um, you know, certainly I've recruited in this area, um, you know, as an assistant at, at Notre Dame and as head coach at Penn State. But there's a little difference of being able to come in here, you know, now and then and having somebody who's been entrenched in the, in the region and, and has those connections and knows like kind of the uh, the landmines to avoid and knows knows where you know the uh, where where the gold is hidden, right? Um, and that's one of the things that John brings is is his connections and um, his experience in in the area. He's a Philly guy, born and bred, coached there, um, and he also has head coaching experience. Um, you know, he was a a head coach early in his career. And uh, so having having that head coach experience and the energy like John is a great teacher of the game. And that's one thing that that really impressed me is his his teaching acumen. Um, and that's been so present in our gym already in, in the short time we've been together. So I'm really fortunate the, the staff that we were able to put together and they um, uh, it's going to I think it's going to be be very, a very good outcome for our program. So starting, uh, you were hired in late May, uh, yes. just two months ago, um, certainly uh, uh, adding challenge upon challenge and in, in taking over a program that late in the off season, uh, currently eight scholarship players on the roster. Um, mm -hmm. How, I guess, in terms of, you know, when a new coach comes in wanting to uh, imprint your, your culture, your philosophies, um, does it make it more challenging in that, you know, you, you have such a... Uh, kind of small roster right now, or is it actually to your favor to a degree in terms of being able to um, connect quicker and, and get everyone bought in? Yeah, I think, I, I think the, the latter, I think um, the size in some respects doesn't matter, but it does matter in terms of how quickly I, as the head coach can build those relationships because it's just, you know, fewer, fewer people. Um, so you're absolutely right about that. I think the thing that's been really good is the receptiveness of 
the, the eight. Um, they had, I mean, you know, I, I tell them all the time that I adopted you guys. You know, I picked you. You didn't have a choice in the matter, right? Um, so I picked you. Uh, but they've been very receptive to me and to our staff uh, coming in. Um, they've been receptive to the way we're going to do things. And, you know, uh, quite obviously, Vivian Stringer and myself were, were different coaches, you know. Um, but, but what we want for the program is the same. You know, we want the program to be uh, a symbol of excellence and a standard bearer for success uh, globally, right? Uh, but how we go about it will be a little bit different. And so that the players have been very, very receptive to our staff, to our style, to the things we want to do. And um, and I think we're building strong relationships and, and we're able to start um, getting our getting the culture in that, that we want to have in place. And not only is it a, a smaller roster, but it is an almost brand new roster. You do have three returning players. Um, wanted to ask just in terms of, you know, China Cornwell was a highly recruited player, um, mm -hmm. you know, ha hasn't um, played necessarily as much as um, you would think going into the last two years. You have Erica Lafayette back, Awasidebe, all contributed to last year's team. Um, yeah. But but uh, I guess – what do you see in them and how are you working to kind of get the most out of them and, and allow them to play to their potential? Yeah. I, you know, the thing is um, they've been great. You know, it's been the great. They've been so receptive, um, uh, pretty hard workers when we get them in the gym. Uh, we haven't been in the gym a ton and that's, that's uh, the thing, you know, we, we only get, I think we get four hours a week, um, which, which sounds like a lot, um, and it's cool, but then we have to go recruiting as soon, you know, they get back, we're here a week and then we go recruiting for the, you know, most of the month of July. So, mm -hmm. so we haven't been in the gym with them a ton. Um, and we're still learning what they can do, how, you know, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, um, uh, how they fit into our style of play. You know, we're, we're going to be a, a team that plays a, a much more up-tempo and at a faster pace. Um, than uh, previous Rutgers teams have played. So, you know, finding uh, out where they are and, and being able to play in that style, we're, we're still in, in the beginning stages of that for sure. And uh, in terms of how you want to play versus, <laughs> you know, it, it, are there going to be adjustments with, with, with such a small roster, you know, to be able to play up-tempo yeah. and you only have eight scholarship yeah. players? Um I guess how challenging is that to kind of have patience or be able to adapt and, and play a, a necessary way right now with the goal of getting to a, you know, a certain style down the road? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's going to be an adjustment. Um, it's going to be adjustment for, I, I think more so for the players than, than for, than for me. Um, but it's absolutely, it's going to be an adjustment. There are going to be some growing pains, um, you know, as we, um, you know, kind of mold this thing in, into what we want it to be. Um, but I, I think I'll, at the end of the day, it'll, it'll be fine. I think playing up tempo, I think our fans will enjoy it. Um, uh, I think our play, I already know our players, they're embracing it. They, 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 they like it. Um, we got to get good at it, but they, they like the, um, the opportunity to get out and play at a faster, play, get a, play at a faster pace. And so uh, we're just going to have to go through the, the growing pains. But um, in the end, you know, you, you have to be true to, to who you are and, and, and our style of play. And, and we'll certainly do that. You also brought in three transfers, uh, Abby Streeter from Hartford, three-point shooter, Cassandra Brown from St. Peter's, uh, mm -hmm. front court player, um, as well as Kai Carter from UNC Asheville. Um, mm -hmm. How did you target them and um, what do they bring to the program? Well, Abby and um, Kai were already uh, right. committed, but when I when I took the job, um, so that the previous staff recruited those two, and they um, decided to honor their commitment uh, once I was announced. So that was that was that was cool that they decided that they were going to stay. Um, so uh, Cassandra um, is somebody that kind of came to our attention late. Um, she was at St. Peter's and they had a coaching change after, you know, even after my uh, records coaching change. Um, so I want to say it was middle of June when the St. Peter's coach um, uh, took a position, another head coaching position. And so there was a coaching change there. And Cassandra 
um, you know, decided she did not want to take, you know, she didn't want to see who the new coach was going to be and decided she wanted to choose her coach, um, you know, going into her uh, uh, last, last, really her senior year, but, you know, she's got the COVID year. So mm -hmm. she wanted to choose the coach and um, John had recruited her out of high school. Um, and so he was familiar with her and knew her family and, and things of that nature. So um, when the opportunity came for us to add another uh, person to, to the team to get to eight, you know, I thought that would be a good thing. And um, we, we talked about it and we got a chance to meet with Cassandra and her parents and her family and thought it would be a good fit. And, and thankfully she said yes. And, uh, and she joined us uh, like, a, I want to say, uh, Monday. <laughs> wow. He actually joined us and got on campus. Uh, yeah, that's, it's amazing how fast things are moving. And uh, I can only imagine the adjustment period. Then you have two freshmen you're working in, yes. um, Antonia Bates, who actually went to Rutgers Prep, and then Kayleen Smichael. Um, yes. what, what was their, um, what was their recruitment? Were they, were they already part of the uh, committed before you got here or did you bring them in? Yes. So really the, the seven, um, players. So Antonia and Kayleen had already committed to Rutgers um, okay. with the previous staff. Um, they honored their commitment um, once I was announced and decided they were going to, you know, they wanted to stay at Rutgers, which, you know, when you think about that, um, those two and the and the two transfer kids that had already committed, um, you know, you really see the the power of the Rutgers program, the Rutgers University name that these guys were like, you know, we'll miss Coach Stringer for sure, but we still want to be a part of Rutgers and we still want to be a part of this women's basketball program. So I was very fortunate um, when I got the job that that those guys stayed committed and stayed locked in to Rutgers. And Kayleen and Antonia were the two freshmen um, coming in um, who said they were going to honor their commitment. And um, and they're 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 great kids. They are they are absolutely um, so much fun to be in the gym with. They have great personalities. Um, they're learning how to work at the college level um, and uh, what they bring from a skill set. You know, Kayleen is is somebody in, in short time who's shown that, you know, she has, has the ability to, you know, kind of knock down some shots. And um, uh, both of them, I will say that they, they show a little bit of versatility. They're going to be able to do multiple things for us. And, um, and, and that flexibility is going to be really, really cool. So building the roster, building the coaching staff, um, how much of the non-conference schedule was completed before you arrived? Um, and have you had any time to even look at that? Have you uh, signed yeah. that to someone? Um, and, and I guess, you know, short term and long term, what's your philosophy in, in putting together a non-conference schedule? Yeah. So the non-conference schedule was complete when I was hired. OK. Um, so. Uh, Nothing, nothing much that I had to do there except for like look at it and you know, <laughs> clutch, clutch my pearls. Um, uh, but yeah, so that was already complete. Um, we've we've got a, a pretty good non-conference schedule. Um, we're, we're, we go to the Battle of Atlantis, Battle for Atlantis um, in the Bahamas, which will be a very very competitive tournament. Um, you know, we play. We have some some local rivalries where we're playing Seton Hall, we're playing Princeton. Um, uh, our ACC Big Ten Challenge game will be Boston College, so that's you know still kind of a uh, a regional uh, rivalry game that we can uh, tap into. So, um, you know, I think uh, our, our conference schedule is going non conference schedule is is going to be tough, um, um, but competitive. I think um, you know hopefully if we can stay healthy and we can and we can get in a rhythm early on, we we can have some success. That's great that Princeton and Seton Hall are back on the schedule. I know, um, you know, they haven't been on the last few years. And, uh, you know, in talking to Pat Hobbs, the AD, I know he he uh, has prioritized wanting to play them in all sports. And uh, it's great to have them back on the schedule. Yeah. Um, in terms of your background, uh, you have a law degree. You were the first um, union president in the WNBA. Um, obviously a little bit different, but I was curious how what your current thoughts are with the changing landscape. NIL name, image, and likeness becoming, you know, at the forefront of uh, college athletics and recruitment and retention. Um, how that experience and background that you have and bring to the table um, will kind of help you navigate through this kind of ever-changing reality of college athletics. 
Well, I think I think uh, it's the legislation, reading the legislation and, and kind of understanding or asking the questions if, if, if the legislation, how, how it works is, you know, where, where my background will come in. Um, I'm excited about the, the changing landscape in some respects. Um, I have always been a, a fan of student athletes being able to um, be like regular students in the in the in the sense that um, you know they can go out in the marketplace and they can uh, get a job or they can use their name, image, and likeness and um, you know and, and market themselves in that way. Um, the, the challenge for us as coaches is going to, going to be helping them balance those things, helping them balance um, their financial uh, part of themselves, their academic part, and their athletic part. So, and, and then the social part too, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we just have to, um, you know, be in a position and a mindset where we help them balance all of those things so that one part doesn't get too out of whack. Um, I don't think, um, and, and I may be a little naive here, um, but at least early on in, in women's basketball, um, I still think who the university is and who the program is will be paramount in folks making their decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it won't be uh, necessarily, I don't see, it won't be who's going to get me the best deal. I mean, I think kids are still gonna gonna want to go somewhere where they can have a great relationship uh, with with their coaching staff. I still think kids are gonna want to go somewhere where the opportunity on the playing field, on the basketball court, football field, whatever it may be, is still in their best interest. Um, and you know, the the NIL opportunities are kind of gonna be icing on the cake um, in, in in some respects. Um, and I, I, I think that's OK. You know, that that's that 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 works for me, um, you know, and hopefully I'm not too naive in thinking that. But I think at the end of the day, it's still going to be those things. The relationships are going to matter. The quality of the opportunity at any given university is going to matter. And who the university is, what do they stand for? What are they about? That's going to matter as well. Shifting gears uh, a little bit, I, I know you know as an assistant at Notre Dame um, what the, formerly the Rack Jersey Mike's Arena yes. can be like, um, and obviously men's games, but you know women's games back then, they're great crowds. Um, yeah. How important that is is to you to build back the fan base um, and get them to, to Jersey Mike's to support this team? Oh, that's it's very very important. I mean, we've got to have the Rack. Uh, there you see, there we go. Right, yeah. the rack. I do it too. <laughs> Uh, Jersey Mike's is an incredible, an incredible home court advantage, especially when that thing is full. And, you know, the Rutgers fans, like they're knowledgeable. So having been on the other end, I've heard them yell some stuff. I mean, they're like, yeah, coach, you need a timeout. This is getting out of control for you. I'm like, I, I know when I need a timeout. Thank <laughs> you. Right. So I'm so looking forward to getting that fan base back back in Jersey Mike's and, and giving us a big time home court advantage and, um, you know, having them cheer for uh, our players. And, 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 I mean, it's just an amazing venue. Um, when I was, when I was an assistant coach at uh, Notre Dame um, and even when I was a head coach at, at, you know, at Penn state, but two places in my career, my coaching career, two places that I absolutely hated to play was DePaul and Rutgers. <laughs> Those two play, you like, oh man, you you are not getting a call when you go to Rutgers. Like you are, you can forget about it. You're not getting a call. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a, a physical. It's going to be loud. It's hot in there. It's sweaty. You know, the, the visiting room, locker room, like it's crappy. Like, so you don't feel good when you go in there, you, you know, like it's like the perfect when you're on the other side. Now that I'm on the other side, I'm like, yes, they got a crappy locker room. They're not going to be happy. They're not going to be comfortable coming out and feeling all good before they warm up. So I am absolutely looking forward to our fan base being there, cheering us on and and uh, helping us get 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 a few close wins because they're yelling at the refs and they're yelling at the <laughs> Team and they throw the ball in the stands. <laughs> well, and it's nice too that you now have the APC to go to for you know everyday operations and practice and 
Um, how has that been a benefit just in terms of, you know, especially having a brand new team essentially and, and, and getting them acclimated and, and kind of build cohesion? Well, I tell you one thing, um, the APC is one of the best practice facilities in the country, hands down, no question. And, and that um, does absolutely have an impact with recruiting. You know, mm -hmm. people want to come to a place that looks like they're getting supported and they're going to be supported in, in their pursuit of excellence um, in the on the court. And the APC certainly certainly does that. You know, we've we've had a few kids up on campus and everybody has been blown away by our facility. So um, that coupled with what their the plans are for updating and upgrading uh, Jersey Mike's arena. You know, I just I just think it's. Um, a place in the time Rutgers women's basketball where kids are going to want to come. And just touching on recruiting, um, obviously you're late in the game and at this point for, for next season, but what's your overall philosophy? How important is recruiting locally for you um, and how, uh, or is it more about fit over, you know, region? Yeah, I think it's both, you know, and the challenge is accomplishing both, accomplishing um, getting kids in the region who are a great fit. Right. That's 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 the goal. Um, I think really since the pandemic, um, in some ways, recruiting is becoming a lot more, a, a little bit more regional. Um, you know, kids want to stay a little bit closer to home. That's that's my experience. Um, you know, I think the farther we get out from that, you know, that 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 will dissipate a little bit. But, you know, being able to be fairly close, you know, in driving range, you know, that that's that's that has proven to matter um, in, in some of these recruiting decisions, um, which is good for us because we you know we're in a rich uh, talent base, um, you know, certainly New Jersey. But, you know, you draw a four hour radius around um, New Jersey, uh, around Piscataway. And, you know, you, you got all the way down to the DMV area. You can get into Ohio a little bit. Um, certainly New Jersey, New York, uh, Philly, PA area. So. Um, there's a lot of talent in the region that we we want to um, tap into and we want to get on campus and um, be strong in our region. And um, but, I, but but I will also tell you this, the Rutgers brand and the Rutgers name is so strong. So when we are making these calls and one of the first things I say, is, so what do you know about Rutgers? And these kids know a lot. You know, they know a lot about the university. They know it's a strong academic uh, university. They know about the history of the program and. Um, so that's been so impressive for me to know that people know a lot about who we are and, and our history and what we've accomplished in the past. So just two more for you, Coach. Um, obviously, since you uh, left Penn State, you were a, assistant coach at two great programs as well at Oklahoma and Notre Dame. What has the whole experience been like for you from um, your last stop as a head coach at Penn State, all the success you had there? Um, obviously, uh, you know, having the last couple of years there and, and what's the biggest thing, I guess, that you've uh, looked at and, and evaluated and kind of learned uh, since your time there to apply in your new role here? Well, I tell you, I feel like I got my master's uh, in coaching um, since I left uh, um, and going to Oklahoma and working with a, another Hall of Fame coach in Sherry Cole. Um, being in the gym with her every day, watching how she ran the program, watching how she structured a program, watching how she taught the kids. Um, she was an amazing, amazing teacher. And probably I think I, I, I don't know if there's a better coach um, who teaches movement off the ball offensively than Sherry Cole. Hmm. Um, so there were so many nuggets that I learned um, being in the gym with her every day, confirming some things that, OK, yeah. So, you know, I was on the right track in, in doing things this way. You know, you watch a Hall of Fame coach do it and you go, yeah, OK. You know, that that does make sense to, to, to keep doing that. And then the transition to Notre Dame um, and be with Neil Ivy as she started her program was really good um, and great experience because now I'm back in. OK, this is what we got to do from day one. This is this is how we got to you know, build the culture. These are the things that we got to do in terms of staff alignment and all that kind of stuff. So being in that position again to refresh and rebuild a program um, and also, you know, not insignificantly watching Miel take over for a Hall of Fame coach. 
mm-hmm. right? And watching how she navigated, you know, through that and and, and seeing how um, all of that played out, you know, being able to be here for that, you know, will definitely be instrumental for me as, as we transition through this first year here at Rutgers. So, you know, I've just felt like I got, like, uh, like I said, my master's degree in coaching again. Um, and just, you know, the, the, the thing that is important is relationships, you know, and making sure that everybody understands roles um, and understand the vision and the mission, and they're committed to that. And if you can make sure that that those things are in place, then um, you know all the success and all that stuff will come for sure. That's a great point. And I uh, just wanted to end it with um, obviously all the challenges you're dealing with, uh, you know, taking over this program in such short notice. What are expectations that you have for this team going into uh, next season and how do you manage kind of expectations within the fan base and the community in terms of having patience um, in getting started uh, as you look to rebuild this program? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because for me coming in, um, the fan base and the administration and everybody is telling me, you know, be patient, coach, be patient. Um So I'm taking their advice. Um, I don't really have um, any expectations along the lines of win this many games or, you know, accomplish this or accomplish that. It's really about, number one, building our and building it, establishing and building our culture. Um, And it's about getting better. You know, it's about getting better every day. It's about getting better game by game, month by month. And we'll see who we become this year. And I want us to be playing our best basketball at the end of the season, play our best basketball in March. Um, And that's, that's really our focus. And, and it'll always be our focus. You know, every team will, you know, will, will reveal itself throughout the season. Um, If we can just keep getting better um, and play our best basketball at the end of the season, um, know that we have grown, um, then, then we'll be in good shape. Rutgers women's basketball head coach, Coquise Washington, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and uh, wishing you the best of luck here at Rutgers and can't wait to see you this season. Thank you so much, Aaron.